Welcome to Cooper Talk. I'm your host, Steve Cooper, and remember, I'm only as hip as my guest. I have to tell you something, people. The big election is on Tuesday, and these advertisements are driving me crazy. It's all that's on TV. It's, I swear, it's like a joke I want to say. I want to watch political commercials, but Jeopardy kept cutting in. I'm trying to watch Jeopardy, every commercial. I just watched the Today Show. Every commercial is these political commercials. And the problem is their quality is just awful. And nobody says anything good. These politicians never say, here's what I'm going to do. They say stuff like in New Jersey, we have a guy named Bob Menendez running, who supposedly picked up hookers, 16-year-old hookers. And they say that. And one guy in Pennsylvania is sitting there saying how, you know, police are, police are, dogs are smarter than police. It's just crazy. I can't wait till it gets done because they're, they're on all the time. And the sad thing is my friend has an eight-year-old and he said every 30 seconds his wife has to switch these commercials because they're talking about prostitutions and hookers. And it's nuts. Anyway, it's good to be back. I've been gone for a while. And uh, my last guest was Mark Valadez, who suggested me this uh, wonderful writer who's got a, has had a great career and I guess sort of mentored Mark. And I'm calling him from, uh, he's across the pond, I guess we would say. And my guest is Eric Blakely. How you doing, Eric? Hey. I'm uh, thrilled to be across the pond. <laughs> I don't envy you guys in that political morass. We're just dealing with Brexit, that's all. We've got the junior political idiots. Well, it's just its just crazy because, I mean, you grew up in this. Well, you, you were born here. And I know you moved to London when you were younger, I think, and then moved back. But it has, it's just changed because we're in an age where there was TV ads, but it's not like every single second. Oh, yeah, it's, it's all gone off the deep end. I haven't watched commercial television probably since I was on it, so I, I, I can't comment on the political ads. I, I would lose my mind if I was being bombarded with them. Now, now you were born in New York, right? Yeah. Now, you were a musician first, is that true? And, and, then, and then you got into writing? You've had a fascinating career, and it seems like you've, you've done very cool things, where one is playing music. And one is being a TV writer, and one is directing a movie. So it's sort of a career that people are very envious, and people right. in Hollywood are going, "Oh God, this guy can do it all." How did you? When did you start knowing you were creative? Oh, uh, when did I start knowing I was creative? I, I probably, uh, you know, sitting in my first day in kindergarten, staring out the window, imagining better scenarios than than existed in the classroom. Uh, you know, the fantasy life just just turned loose and it, it, it never stopped now so uh, yeah the, so the fan the first fantasy was to be was to be a musician which was my first love and that later uh, i came to this real my salieri moment where i realized as good a musician as i was that i wasn't an elite musician and then i, I might be even better with words so i foolishly Switch, and I, and I had this—I had this ridiculous notion that um, I, I it used to drive me crazy being in bands and being at the mercy of a guitar player's, you know, bad temper or a, you know, a drummer's conflict, whatever. I thought, you know, I'm going to become a, a writer so that I'm totally in charge of my own fate. And the joke was on me because I got the the, the worst committee of you know corporate network executives that would make you know recalcitrant guitarists you know seem like a dream so anyway now you, you played the did you play the bass is that what i heard yes yes um yeah that was uh that is my instrument and uh uh when i was 17 i uh, I, I got accepted to juilliard and I, I thought i'd go to london for two weeks and just check it out before i buckled down to some serious study and uh, I was asked to join a band you know, like three weeks before I turned 18. And I, I, I just called my, my dad up and said, Dad, you don't have to worry about giving me tuition for a Juilliard. I'm not coming back. So <laughs> I, I stayed for five years and played. And now what you know? was that like? I mean, what, what kind of music did you play? I'm sure the scene then must have been, I mean, it's always a great scene over there. But what was the scene? What were you guys playing? Well, I was playing, I started playing rock music. And then I really got into, you know, funk and soul music so uh it started with rock bands and then went went to soul bands i, I was uh i got a job as a musical director and bass player for for a kind of british jackson five like super low rent jackson five called the hippolytes so we did a tour of the kind of was kind of like a soul music spinal <laughs> tap and uh 
So, uh, yeah. So I did both of those, rock music and soul music. Yeah. So you're playing, and now when did you decide to make the move to L.A.? Was there a, a definitive point, or did you just sit there and go, as you said, you, were, you knew you weren't going to excel in music because, you know, you have to be so amazing. When did you decide that? I mean, what made you decide it, and why did you choose L.A.? Um, it, was, it was kind of a strange process because I, I went back to New York for a little while, and I went in the dead of winter, and it was just I just couldn't handle the cold. And I I met somebody in, in uh, when I was in London, some American, and he said, "Yeah, I think you live in like Stockton, California." And he said, "Come on out." And uh, so you know, I, I just said I can't handle the cold, so I came there, and I stayed in the Bay Area for a little while, and then and uh, just kind of like you know bumming around from from base gig to base gig, and then I just thought, you know what, California dreaming is all you know it's about the beat in the surf and I, I just decided to go to LA and be you know a completely vapid and frivolous wastrel and uh, you know lift weights and go to the beach and get, you know do, do that do that whole thing and um, I was I was actually I went back to college and I was uh, I, I realized that you know my gift was with words and that I should uh, throw myself into figuring out how to how to form a proper sentence um, and uh, my best friend was a stuntman, and he said, "You know, you're, I, my dream was to be a short story writer. I, you know, idiotic." And <laughs> my my best friend said, "Hey, uh, you know, you're never going to pay your rent being a short story writer." He said, "Why don't you become a screenwriter, and you can get you know, get a big success, and you know, buy a cool pad in the Hollywood Hills like Errol Flynn." And uh, so we went to the movies that night. I, I don't remember what movie it was, but um, he just said, "Check it out." See if you think you could do it. So I looked at it. I kind of, you know, it was the first time I was very analytical about a movie. I, you know, I looked at, you know, each scenario and the way the story was was laid out. And I listened, especially because I was a musician. I really thought movies were about dialogue. So I listened to see if I had an ear for that, if I could feel the music of language, of spoken language. And, uh, I, you know, I came out of the movie theater and said, yeah, I can do that. And that's you know, the grand birth of a screenwriter. Well, it's funny, you know, when you try to write a screenplay, because I wrote one when I was in L.A., and everyone seems to write one, and it's changed yep. now. But back then, the formatting sucked. Like, we, I mean, I think I wrote mine in one of those old little brother uh, word processor that has the little top up top, and you had a disc that could save, like, four pages. But it was it must have been it was so hard back then. I mean, how did you find out how to write a screenplay? Because it's not like now you can go online. I mean, did you have to go to Samuel French and buy a copy of a screenplay and go, this is the formatting, or did you buy Sid Field's book, or how did you learn how to start I, formatting? I bought Sid Field's book. I took every class. Uh, you know, there it's it's Hollywood. There've always been screenwriting classes long before I showed up, and uh, I, I you know I just. Uh, I studied everything about writing, just everything that I could, and uh, I read every every great script and uh, just absorbed everything. And I, 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 I was just, I, I think for six months I just lived in my car and in the library um, at City College and just read scripts and you know used used the shower facilities there and just came out the other end like ready ready to write. And I, I just wrote one screenplay after another. It was a different time. I, I don't think you could do it now the same way that I did it then. I, I really just kicked in the, you know, kicked in the door or, or, or annoyed my way into every possible uh, connection that, you know, I, I, some friend, uh, I'd be at a party and somebody would say, hey, you know, her uncle is uh, an agent. Uh, I go, you know, go and talk to the person and just you know, see if I can get introduced. And, and you know, step by step, like, each increment, you know, first I got I got an agent but no work and then that guy i wrote more scripts that got me another agent who you know got me an option for something and and it just i just chipped away at it but all this time i was uh very concentrated on my craft i had no idea of what it really takes to be successful in hollywood and you know when i give a talk now i i kind of refocus i'm i'm i'm, I'm always happy to to discuss the craft of writing i just i i really dig it and it gets very philosophical and I think probably of all the screenwriting gurus John Truby was the best of them because he was so philosophical at his core 
Um, then we became great friends and we worked together on shows. Um, but one of the things now when I give a talk is, is I say really more than your craft to be a writer, manage your career. And that's, that's the biggest adv you know, advice I can possibly give. So, and best. Uh, but in those days, I just believe the only key to success was to become such a good writer that I couldn't be denied. And that's all I did. That's all I did was work on that. And I was, I was a pretty mediocre writer for a very long time, even when I first started working. And uh, there were kind of some key moments where I, I, had to, I had to raise my game in order to be where I wanted to be. And, and uh, I did that. And, and, you know, good things happened. Now, what was your first gig? You know, you got on the IMDb. You, know, you said you said you got an option, but for TV, you know, it says it was an equalizer. How did you transform into TV when you wanted to be a screenwriter? Was it something you just said, you know what, I have an opportunity, I want to make money, or was it just something that you made a, a decision that was something that stuck out to you that you said TV could be right for me? I wanted to make a living as a screenwriter, and I had... Um, a spec screenplay that was a little bit hot at the time. It, you know, it was one of those things, uh, as so many of them almost get made, uh, so many of the good ones. It was a good script, and somebody, uh, this new show was starting The Equalizer, yeah, and, and uh, somebody said, oh, you know, you know, that kid's good, let's bring him in. So that was, you know, my first, my first shot, and... Um, I, I was totally unaware of the politics of the time. I, um, I, I, I had a writing partner then, and we went in, and um, the story editor, uh, we, we didn't realize that there was a war between the two factions, the New York faction of the show and the L.A. faction of the show. So we were bored, uh, originally brought in by the L.A. guys, but the New York guys actually turned out to like us more. Um, so what happened was, the L.A. story editor um, gave us this terrible note, which is, you know, the equalizer, somebody gets in, in trouble, they get involved in a crime, and then they, they go to the equalizer to bail them out. So this story editor said, you know, we're going to do something really cutting edge and brilliant on, on this show, on your episode. We're not going to show the crime. The guy's just going to go back home and tell his wife what happened. And we're arguing, but this, you know, this this is... This guy is above us. So the script comes in and, you know, the, it, it's it's got its moments. But the truth of the matter is, is it's a joke. You can't you, you, it has no setup. So the guys in New York got the script. They kind of, you know, they kind of liked it. But um, uh, Woody Gould, the, the great Woody Gould, who um, he wrote the, the uh, John, Tom Cruise movie Cocktail and, and the novel. Uh, and he was an old newspaper man. And I think he just recognized something. And he rewrote the script and. We went to meet him in New York when they were shooting it, and and he said, "Yeah, the script was, you know, you guys were really good, but what the fuck were you thinking, leaving out the crime?" <laughs> and we were like, "Uh, well, you know, that's what we were told to do." And he goes, "Oh shit, you know, did so and so make you do that?" He goes, "Okay, listen, you know, you were being sabotaged." And that was kind of my first first look at the, you know, the fact that uh, uh, that that all writers weren't my brothers. <laughs> So you, you and uh, okay. my first taste of the politics of, of television. So did that sour so, yeah. you? Did that sour well, you on the it, scene or what? You know, I, I it, it it it's it, it was a souring experience, but it, the, the reality was, you know, the guy Woody Gould kind of mentored me, and he just said, "Listen, you know, it's a political game," and he says, "I'm going to lose this battle." You know, he was like co-show running. He was the New York side, and he says, "I'm just not a good enough politician." but you you'll need to be and i didn't realize how important that advice was at the time because uh, i mean uh the politics of hollywood w were my perpetual downfall i mean i would always get in trouble uh it was only the writing that ever kept me in there uh, you know I, I did some really good writing uh, eventually not not at the time of the equalizer and uh it, it it kept me alive for you know nearly 20 years in the business but it, it but i um i, I mean i would continually uh play the play the political game wrong and 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 get my head chopped off only to you know find another way into you know we into the court i always when i give one of my talks i always say when you come to hollywood you're coming to a royal court and you have to understand the protocols which which i believe 
believe wholeheartedly it really, truly is a royal court. And I've never understood the protocols, but I've always found, you know, every time I get thrown out of the castle, I always find a side door and they said, hey, I'm a really good writer. Let me in. They go, oh, yeah, we need really good writers. Come on in. And then, and then somebody somebody eventually finds out and go, why did you let that guy back in? <laughs> well, well you, you wrote on Moonlighting. Uh, and that was that was early. That was like I think the second season. Were you on that? Yeah, yeah. What was that like? Because I think I mean it, that show blew up. But I don't know if, to, if until it blew up in the second or third season. But did you know that you were going onto a project that I've heard that the the set may could be a little bit difficult, or that may have been later. What was that like when you got in there? And and you know, Sybil Shepherd was a movie star from like last picture show, I believe who right. came to TV. What was that like coming in to write in a, in a situation like that? That was the darkest writer's room I had ever seen in my life. I was totally unprepared for, I, 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 it, I, I would have, it would have been easier. had Caligula come in, made me have sex with his horse and then chuck my arms and legs off. <laughs> uh, it was, it was uh, a, a cesspool. It was it was horrendous. Uh, again, another situation where uh, I'm taking direction from people who are fighting for their lives and um, sabotaging a very cool uh, a very cool episode. And 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 you know it was so early in my career. I'd never been on staff. I wasn't on that staff. I was only a freelancer. And um, again, you know, another real realization that you know. Uh, the writers were not, you know, were not my uh, my brothers and sisters. Um, it was very hard. So there were a lot of those, and they and they they, they caused me uh, tremendous pain at that point in my career. But but with the, there was also this idea, which was, what the hell else are you going to do for a living, man? You know, you're you're, you're going to go back to playing bass and uh, play in Holiday Inn lounges. So I was just like, you made your bed, man. You're in this. And I just, I just kind of lowered my head, kept doing freelance episodes, um, and then I did a Cagney and Lacey, and it was, it was like walking into the summer of love. Uh, Jonathan Eskren and Shelley List ran Cagney and Lacey. They couldn't have been more welcoming or indulgent, and it was, uh, it was just. Uh, like unicornsville, uh, rainbows and, and flowers, and you know they, they uh, I was still you know a, a fairly new you know brat, and I'd, I'd actually been kind of poorly trained by these na nasty experiences, and they were just like you know just loving people and just uh, oh this kid's talented, we'll let him do this and that and help him do this, and that kind of I started to see that there there in fact were brothers and sisters in the business because my my. My first year or two in it, they, they, they were not. They were just, you know, treacherous trolls who, you know, looked glamorous. And, and so that kind of gave me this ideal model and, uh, you know, to kind of strive toward. But I, I think it was just a, a brief moment in time. I never, I never again encountered that kind of welcoming atmosphere and that kind of supportive environment. Um, and uh, after Cagney and Lacey, uh, let See, I did Crime Story at about the same time with Michael Mann. And uh, Michael, I, 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 we kind of always liked each other. Michael never liked my writing, but everybody else seemed to. So he kind of, he kept me around. I did a few episodes for them. And, uh, but um, so exacting and so fussy, and he hated reading. So, he, he, you know, he'd started as a writer, but he hated reading scripts, which I, I totally understand. And, and um, I just thought, you know what, I'm, I'm going to take a new approach to writing. This was, and at this point, I'd split up with my partner, and I, I, I did one of the crime stories on my own. And it was, I said, you know, you're going to approach every scene you write as a movie. It, it's just got to have an amazing beginning, middle, and end, and stand on its own. And I, I kind of used that, and, and it, it jumped me up into, into the next level, and that... And, and Michael didn't like the script, but the network loved the script, and they insist they could, they insist he threw my script out, and then the network said, uh, "No, put Blakeney's script back in." So Michael got pissed at me, and he didn't hire me again. But we we became friends later, because you know, uh, down the road, uh, friendly anyway. You know, we'd say hello to each other, and you know, <laughs> breathe. Um, but um, but it was a breakthrough, and then I got hired on the show. Um, let's see, I did Max Headroom after that, and that was a 
a, a really exciting and you know inventive experience. And I, I really wanted that job, uh, but my friend couldn't get me on staff there. And then I was offered this wise guy job, and that blew it. Yeah, that just blew up my career. I, I just uh, uh, you know I got nominated for or got some mystery writers award and all kinds of stuff. And uh, uh, the next thing I know, I was uh, rescuing Twenty One Jump Street, and they they put they made me the showrunner on Jump Street. So. Uh, um, you know, I was just, uh, I w wasn't, it, I, I mean, I succeeded upward, but I kind of, I was tripping and blundering the whole way because I never made w one smart political move in, in, in my career. And I'm still, I'm still hoping to make a, a clever political move. But, uh, <laughs> well, why is, the, why is the, that? Don't, oh, sorry, go ahead. You're shutting. No, sorry, go ahead. No, Wise Guy was, uh, was a, was a great show that, I mean, had a great cast and a lot of people, I don't know if it was. I don't know if a lot of people watched it as much as it should have been watched. And it always bothers you when a show, you know, is really good and a great writing's great. What was it like working on a set that you said, you know, you felt like you were in your groove, and it was a very critically acclaimed show. What is that like as a writer? Is that like you're sitting there playing in the major leagues if you were a baseball player? Yeah, it's definitely like being in the major leagues. Uh, and the, you know, the other shows were also the main major leagues but this was this is getting the start in the major you know you know what i mean like i was a bench warmer on a major league team when i was on crime story and you know moonlighting you know but just you know i was a guy I was i was on the roster but you know i wasn't starting uh wise guy yeah you you you're, you're you're on the yankees and you know you're playing you know you're playing right field or you know center field and, you know uh it's 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 a great thing um it got us a lot of it was it was also a political cesspool that show was was very very difficult um uh, the um there were games all the time and there was a it was kind of funny the guy who was uh the de facto showrunner uh was david burke and david had, uh, worked with me on crime story we were friends but we kind of uh, uh the rivalry between us and he was my boss but the rivalry became so intense now uh what's considered the probable the greatest uh you know arc in wise guy was the very first one with ray sharkey because uh and the, the movie donnie brasco was it just note for a rip off of that ray sharkey arc with uh um uh the sunny steelgrave character um that we did a two-parter david and uh, i uh which was the death of the demise of sunny steelgrave and that that just uh kind of was a game changer in television it really Really, you don't really get things like The Sopranos until, un, you know, until that happens. Uh, um, it was the first time in TV history that I know of that the bad guy was the hero. I mean, he was the, I always wrote Sonny Steelgrave as the good guy and the, the hero of the show, uh, Vinny Terranova, played by Ken Wall, as the betrayer. Uh, Sonny was pure and loved, loved, you know, uh, the Vinny character and Vinny was setting him up for to take him down um and that 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 just you know changed things by the late 90s you know johnny depp did did donnie brasco they repeated the exact same dynamic and uh the whole bad guy as you as vulnerable human being was obviously done incredibly you know with tony soprano so so yeah it was it was amazing to be in you know it's i, I don't know it's like playing with you know you played with chuck berry you know the beatles came out later but you see you know in the stones and everything but you played in you know you were on chuck berry's thing you know so it was it, it was like that it, it was great i'm very grateful to have had that opportunity and it, it certainly elevated my writing uh david and i had a horrible rivalry but we brought out the best in each other i mean we're just like uh you know there was i, I not to compare us to lennon, lennon and mccartney but they used to do that one would write something very cool john lennon would write strawberry builds forever and then paul would feel like oh you know i gotta come back and he'd write penny lane and and david and i were, were definitely doing that on the show and everybody else was kind of i don't know kind of pushed off to the side as the the, the two latest hollywood brats just dueled with each other to make uh some amazing television and we did yep what was it like working with ray sharkey 
Uh, I love Ray. Uh, we, we became great pals. Um, we did a pilot together. Uh, when, I, when I left um, Jump Street, um, which would be like an, a, a year or two, maybe two years after I did Wise Guy, uh, we, we did a pilot together. The, the pilot that I pitched was I, I pitched The Shield. I was, uh, before, you know, 15 years before The Shield. I was trying to do, uh, a, you know, a corrupt a corrupt cop and i wanted ray sharky to be that and the networks you know they they have sponsors they just wouldn't let you do that and that was that was probably the hardest part of my career was was realizing where television was eventually going to go and that it was going to be about doing bad guys and i kept doing pilots about bad guys that everybody loved um one after another and uh but but the networks wouldn't put them on the air it was they just said we can't, you know, we can't glorify a bad guy. We'll lose all our sponsors. But Ray was was brilliant. Loved, you know, loved working with him. He 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 was a true artist, um, and you know, a tragic figure in his personal life. Um, but you know, I I I got into the business, be you know, because I'm, I'm you know, an arty creative type, and that's what I gravitate towards, you know, crazy people who, who are very inventive. Now, 21 Drum Street, you were brought in to show run it. Now, you had never run a show before, so was that something that it was a big jump for you? Or, I mean, how did you transition into that? Um, I, well, I was, I was good friends with the showrunner. We used to, you know, go out drinking together, and he, had, he created the show, Patrick, and he was, he was, at the end of the second season and um he got a really bad script from one of his staff members and the network and don't forget this was the number one show on fox this made the fox network um and um they, the network would not accept the script it was at bad and he, he he was in the middle of a <laughs> A, 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 per, a very personal tribulation he was he was having a breakdown and he came into my office you know, he, and he was always very funny. He goes, well, Blakeney, the network's going to shut me down. And I was like, no, don't be ridiculous. You got their number one show. They can't do that. And he said, dude, he said, I, I got five episodes left in the season and I'm, I'm, I'm losing it. He says, I don't want to put any pressure on you, buddy. But if you don't take over these five episodes, I'm jumping out your window right <laughs> now. <laughs> and I said, I said, well, Patrick, the windows don't open, but that's OK. Uh, I, 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 I agreed to do it. And I rewrote that script. It would it was already cast and pre it was it had already been prepped. They were about to shoot in three days. I rewrote the script uh, in th in two days, and it, it was uh, it, it was just you know magical. I, everybody flipped out. The network, uh, uh, you know, they were dancing. So I had it, it was kind of this just just dumb luck. I was just I, that was really being in the right place at the right time, but all. Also having the skills, um, I, I really was coming into my own as a writer, and I realized how to, how to take this really shitty revenge episode and to and and to give it some thematic depth. And so I, you know, I, I reached into my bag of tricks and I, I I pulled some cool stuff off, and everybody went went crazy. So at the end of the season, um, so I did that with the rest. You know, the, 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 uh, I took over the the the. the the last five episodes, the writing, you know, and kind of overseeing them. And uh, it was we went out with a real bang and Patrick's contract was up and he he left. Go to to a deal at Disney. So, uh, you know, they were talking about, uh, well, we've, we've got we need a showrunner. And uh, the president of the company was Peter Roth, and he was my great champion and protector. And he said, listen, I, I you know, I believe this kid can do it. Uh, he did. He already he just demonstrated that he can he won't and he was able to convince the money guys he said he won't cost anything we've got him on, we've got him under contract very cheaply so uh they gave me the show and it was kind of one of those weird things where uh he said we can't give you the title executive producer you'll be the supervising producer but you'll be the executive producer's boss i said wait a minute so i'm going to come in i'm going to be the vice president uh and i'm going to be the president's boss they said yeah you're going to run 
the show. And they said, but for political reasons, actually what they told me was because David Burke hadn't been given that title yet. They said it'll create too much trouble if we get you the title that, that we haven't given him yet. So just be a good soldier. I said, sure, I don't mind. I'll be vice president and I'll be the boss of the press. I was like the first Dick Cheney. <laughs> So I, I ran the, I ran the show and uh, and it was you know it was amazing it was incredibly difficult there was a riot a five month writers strike I took the long but and Cannell would not uh, take a short or everybody in Hollywood took a short season because they didn't have time to prep I shot twenty four episodes by the time we finished that year uh, I didn't have any words left I'd go to a dinner party my you know my wife would take me to a dinner party with friends and my, I'd be like drooling down my shirt you know somebody everybody was expecting me to make all this witty conversations and I'd, I'd be like oh pass pass salt please you know so so that show but now then you create a booker how did that come about i know it's so funny i remember when a greco showed up on 21 jump street you know all the girls were like oh who's this guy but you know no one ever really thought there'd be a spinoff but did they just because he was so liked in the first season is that what happened and then they came to you and said create the show for his character well, um, wow, that's another big political cesspool. Uh, I, I've been really, he blew up. We brought him on the show. I, I felt that the show was a little bit boring uh, in that all the, you know, they, uh, they were all kind of just, just nice. So I wanted to bring in like a bad boy, you know, a Mickey Rourke type, you know, when Mickey Rourke looked, you know, like a handsome human being. Um, and uh, so I brought Greco on to Jump Street and uh, Johnny Depp wanted to leave the show but he didn't want another you know another handsome boy on the show to take you know to take over for him so Johnny and I had been good pals uh, we used to play a lot of music together and do our fair share of drinking together but once I brought Greco on I think he felt a little betrayed by me and um, so that turned into a, a very difficult scene uh, so we had a lot of problems with Johnny uh, who, who wanted to go do movies, but also was very angry that we brought in another, you know, sexy boy. And Greco just blew up. His his billboards everywhere. It, you know, he he was as big as Johnny Depp that year. And so at the end of the season, um, uh, Barry Diller came. He, they wanted to, get, to give me my own show. They were so pleased with the way I'd run Jump Street. They just said, you know, and I was anointed. I was going to be the next god of television and show you how well I handled it. In any case, um, what. What they originally asked me to do was Barry Diller had this idea that he wanted to do a TV series about kids in Beverly Hills High School, which became Beverly Hills 90210. So they came to me first and asked me to do it. And I said, no fucking way. I am. I do not want anything to do with kids in high school anymore. And I don't want to deal with Beverly Hills brats, especially. So I said, count me out. <laughs> so then 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 Barry Diller said, well, would you do a show uh, like a rock and roll detective? I don't I said, yeah, I'd rather do that than Beverly, kids in Beverly Hills High School. So they said, well, why don't we do it as a spinoff for Richard Grieco? And I said, yeah. So I came up with this idea, and it was it was a pre Twin Peaks. It was the it was a detective show based on the uh, this this idea that 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 the sub herbs are dangerous and that's where the real madness in america is not you know not on the the dirty streets of the city but in fact you know in all those bedroom communities so I, I i just came up with this crazy this crazy thing that was slightly twin peaksy about i don't know a year or two before uh, twin peaks came out and um i got fired i was the hottest writer in television and they fired me from my own show so that was the booker so you get you get fired so then what, what are you what are you thinking are you just thinking you know Hollywood is bullshit. I mean, you have to be frustrated because you're the hottest guy around. You you saved Twenty One Jump Street per se. You got the spinoff. I mean, what do you do as a writer at that point? Well, I I, I at that point I had tremendous heat, so I made a I, I had a lot of people fighting for me to make an overall deal to create shows. So I was like, hey, you know what? I'm, I'm going to go. I'm going to go with a cool company, and I'll get paid, you know, a, a, a giant amount of money, and uh, you know, I'll play with my kids while I write pilots, and I'll see. So I had this idea that I'm going to do something amazing. I'm going to be the first guy to do a television series about a bad guy. So 
I, I made um, multiple deals, but I made a big overall deal. First, I did a pilot for Ray Sharkey at ABC, uh, uh, which um, we couldn't we couldn't get on the on the air. It was about you know a, a corrupt cop who was you know thrown off the force kind of thing. Then um, I had I had a few pilot commitments at ABC, so I did. Um, uh, they everybody was just like, "What do you want to do, Eric? What do you want to?" Do? Which doesn't mean what do you want to do, Eric? They, they just it just means that's what we have to say to you. Uh, what they wanted me to do was another Twenty One Jump Street, you know, cute kids and you know, hot, sexy young cops, which is exactly what I didn't want to do. I, I thought, and all I did was I went into every meeting and said, let me do let me do a show about a bad guy. That's going to be the next next thing. And I would yeah, so I, I I I kind of wasted all my heat writing these amazing pilots one after another about bad guys. And, uh, you know, that the next thing, you know, I wasn't the hottest writer in Hollywood anymore. And I was you know, still, you know, getting getting deals here and there. And uh, I decided to uh, I did I, I, I got a, a brief job co-running uh, this show called VR5. Um, with Laurie Singer, who was great. She was really lovely to work with uh, and stepped in, you know, an, another another kind of political nightmare. And uh, at that point, I just, you know, I said to wife, I said, you know what, I'm done doing TV. Let's, I'm going to try to do movies. Let's move up. We had a little house on a vineyard. We sold the house in LA. And we moved up to up to the vineyard, and uh, I started doing movies. And I started, you know, rewriting some films, and you know, I did a couple of a couple of uh, TV movies, and then uh, uh, I optioned a script, uh, a thriller to Lumiere. At the same time, I was offered uh, uh, a job going to Australia and working on Mad Max Fury Road. So that gave me a tremendous amount of heat. Um, so I was able to turn, parlay that into uh, writing. I, I got a big deal when I came back. I, I wrote a, a, a spec script for this movie that I wrote and directed called Gunshy. And so when I came back to town from Australia, I had the hottest spec feature and I and, and I had heat. So um, I turned that into a two-picture deal at Warner Brothers. Uh, one of the one of the uh, one of the pictures I wrote was a book adaptation for Sandra Bullock, where uh, she never made it, but it was a, about kind of a nurse who kind of uh, falls in love with a Unabomber guy who's locked in her ward. And uh, it started a really good relationship with Warner Brothers and Sandra Bullock. And um, I, uh, I had the super hot script gun shy, but I was insisting that I direct it. And uh, a lot of studios tried to buy it to give to big directors. And eventually I just found a way, uh, well, really with Sandra Bullock's help, uh, to to direct it myself. Now, and that was, yeah. I was going to say the directing part. Now, did, is this just something that had you wanted to start directing, you know, back in your TV days? Or was this something, because it's a difference between directing a TV show and, and a movie. And, you know, it's, I mean, people who don't aren't in the business don't understand that directing especially when you write it you're taking on such a big big responsibility and 18 19 hour days what made you want to direct it it's because you wanted to control your vision yeah i think i wanted to make sure that i could get it as close to what my vision was as possible i had no oh uh I obviously, as a showrunner, I've been on set with a lot of direct. I've had to, I'd had to direct over directors' shoulders. I had to recut their, you know, their their material when they when they you know screwed it up. Uh, so there was there was a lot of rescuing directors, and I just thought, you know what, I'm going to give this a shot. I want to see if I can get this thing as close to, you know, as possible and uh, to my vision. And um, I was curious to see how much uh, you know how much uh, I would enjoy it, and I loved it. The directing itself. Now, there's probably nothing harder than uh, politically than p the post-production process on a studio feature. Uh, it, uh, I mean, it made television seem relatively tame. Uh, but the actual directing itself, working with the actors and and uh, you know and the, the cinematographers and the production design, everybody. I loved it. I loved every second of it, and I wished I'd I wished I'd done more of it. Eric? Yep. Okay. okay. I know you cut out for a second. 
Um, so, so no, it's not, it's not your fault. So, so you enjoyed the experience. Now you worked with, uh, it was Liam Nielsen and it was Sandra Bullock. Yeah. Now Liam wasn't the huge name yet, but did you know that he was going to become this huge star? Uh, well, he was still, he was a pretty big star then. Um, and he just signed to play Qui-Gon Jim in the, you know, in the star Wars movie. And, uh, so, I mean, he, he, he was, he was, not he hadn't done Taken, which was his big action movie. Uh, so he didn't have a franchise on, under his belt, but you know he'd been in the running to play James Bond. Uh, he, uh, um, no, I didn't. I you know he was he was just considered a quality actor, and uh, he was just really game to do a comedy, and and was completely dedicated to his craft. I just we really hit it off. I loved working with him. We we had a magical time on set. We, uh, he and Oliver Platt just adored each other, and we just spent most of the time giggling. Really, he re rehearsed very hard uh, before the shoot. Just Liam and I on, at my kitchen table reading every night as as he kind of found the music of his character and you know wanted to really understand every every moment that he was going through. And uh, he 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 gave an amazing performance. Uh, I don't think I don't think audiences ever really wanted to see him as a vulnerable, you know, comic figure. But um, but he was great in it. Now, after that movie, you know, when then what what do you, what's your direction after that? I mean, did you have more directing offers or what happened? I did have a few directing offers. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I got, I got, I was burned out on the business. I, I, um, I just had to leave, I, I had to leave the, you know, the, the business and, and the States and, and just, uh, go find, uh, uh, other ways to, to satisfy myself creatively and emotionally. So I kind of stepped away from a while and I, I mean, I fell into, I, I, I still, I, you know, I doctor scripts and I, I, um, uh, I still keep my hand in it, but, uh, um, I really, I couldn't, pl I couldn't play Hollywood anymore. I just couldn't, couldn't do it. Well, that happens to a lot of people. I think a lot of people, you know, it is a, is a, is a really a wear and tear and a, and a grind. And I think for writers, you know, I mean, as you said, you know, you're writing all these uh, pilots, you know, I had Jeff Astroff on my show who just came out with the great show trial and error, which he had, he couldn't get it made on his own. And he said the same thing where it's yeah. these, these, the networks, they don't want, even though it's great work, they tell you, oh, this is great, but we want this. And as a writer who is yep. established like you were, it must really suck because that'd be like you being a, a scientist for a company for 20 years and solving all things and go, hey, I got this inventive uh, inventive system that's going to cure cancer. And them going, well, you know what? Maybe we don't, Maybe we don't want that. Oh yeah, it's 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 soul destroying. I mean, you re, you really when, when you're doing amazing work, you know, you, it's uh, you, uh, I, mean, I, I just can imagine what Nikola Tesla must have felt like. You know, we're dealing with with guys like Edison, who's saying, "Listen, you know, I know what to do with this electricity thing. Let's shoot it over here." Uh, uh, um, that's pretty grandiose comparing myself to Tesla, but in any case, the frustration of being being very creative and, 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 and being at the top of your game and seeing things that you know are going to work and having the guys in the suits who are mostly cowards, you know, they're, they're, they're corporate guys, they're trying to, they're, they're only uh, political, no matter how much they say, oh, you know, they they feel an incredible bond with the creative people, they're just, you know, they're not telling the truth, you know, they, they, they have to say that they have to make those relationships with creative people. Uh, it was, uh, it was something I, I, I never had the ability to really juggle. Uh, I was really fortunate that, that one of the guys in the suits, Peter Roth, uh, um, w was my champion for a while. I think, I think in, for many reasons, I, I, his, I, I think his father was a publisher and I, I think that household, the, you know, he, even though you know he went the business route, I think there was a respect for the written word in Peter's house, um, and he he brought that into into the meeting. So so yes, it, you know it's not that they were all Nazis, but you know the majority of them were certainly you know cowardly people, and uh, 
um, never really be uh, ready to 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 open the doors of, of creativity and, and you know let the uh, let the creative people uh, uh, bring their dreams to the you know to the TV screen. Oh, they're, they're forced to do it. I mean, I, I think TV has been amazing for the last I don't, since the Sopranos. Really, I, I think the, I think um, HBO and all the other cable services and uh, I think uh, the streaming services have have opened up the ability to just to just be as mad as 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 you care you care to be and inventive um it's it's still from what i understand incredibly political but but it's it's be it become beautifully inventive i i love a tremendous work being done i mean mad men was 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 brilliant you know uh that tv series rome was like the greatest thing i've ever seen on television and i just loved it um uh, um, so yeah, it was just unfortunately for me, there were four networks when I was doing it, uh, and even though I saw that we were going to that the, the cre- creatively we needed to give that to an audience, it was it was a little bit too soon. That's all. That's all that really happened. Now, why did you choose London? Well, I came here when I was a, a young lad. I've always had an. This is kind of a city that's always been good to me, and. Uh, um, I didn't come here first. Uh, we went when, when we left uh, California, uh, moved to Spain for a few years and kind of back and forth. And, uh, um, I wound up, I, I, I moved to, I moved to Belgrade. I, I co-authored three metaphysical books by this, for this, uh, kind of, uh, Rasputin kind of dude back, back there, which was one of the most creatively challenging and, and mind experiences expanding experiences as a writer um and then um then I, I i i moved to portugal for a while and just kind of gravitated toward uh toward uh, my people here in london so i'm here i'm here now yeah now what do you do with your free time there now i mean i know you said you were doing a podcast you come up and you speak to people but what do you do with your free time in london like what's 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 a, a week for like an eric blake new week <laughs> Well, I am involved in, in, in a crazy venture, uh, which is um, a, an, an online movie studio uh, called the People's Republic of Movies uh, that is based on social capitalism and uh, um, cooperative uh, ownership so that everybody who works on a movie owns a piece of the movie. I'm, I, uh, this is, you know, my, my, uh, my latest win mill that I'm tilting at, which is I, I want to see, I, I think everybody is really uh, seeing the flaws in a predatory capitalist system where we're all competitors to each other. And I think I think there's a generation of people that that see the value of, of, of uh, collaboration. And uh, I, I think that's where our, our, our wealth lies. Look, uh, being on staff, you know, in, in, in television, uh, we were always kind of set against each other but we it, so our, our survival you know was very darwinian and, and and predatory and yet we did our greatest work when we collaborated with each other david and i may uh, on, on uh, burke and i may have been the great you know blood rivals on wise guy but the truth of the matter this is when he he and i would go out for a beer and talk about how we were going to plan you know the, the demise of the sunny steelgrave character there's nothing on earth quite like it and we would not have done it without collaborating with each other. As good as each of us were, we weren't going to do do it as well as we did it together. So I'm trying to get. Uh, I've got a lot of people who really love this here and are, are hoping that I can I can find a way to kind of remake a production company that um, that can uh, both uh, be fulfilling and give people equi- equitable shares in 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 their work. Um, and I'm also trying. We've also got a really fantastic way to protect investors from Hollywood accounting using the blockchain to track all the revenues. So it's it's a very grandiose concept, and um, that is how I'm spending most of my time in London these days. That's awesome. It's good. You're, at least you're you're still being creative, and that's what's good. You bet. 
Well, I, I want to thank you for taking the time to talk to me today. This was great. As I said, you know, you've had a prolific thing at work. I wish, you know, I wish people could go back. I don't know if Wise Guy is on Netflix, but I wish people could go back and watch that because it was such a good show. And, you know, Ray passed away. And Ken Wall pretty much disappeared. It's very odd. And I believe, was Jonathan Price on that show? Yes, he was. Who people you may know as Mike, people on Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul. So it, it's an amazing cast. But well, for you, it must have been just great to be able to, you know, have these people who are so talented bring your words to life. It was, it was, it was brilliant. And, and you know, it's funny. It was a very inconsistent show. So we, we'd fall on our faces a lot, but we also reached amazing heights. So yeah, I was uh, absolutely fantastic to be involved in it. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you for taking the time. So people go to IMDB, check out Eric Blakeney, go back, see his work, go watch his shows, you know, <laughs> and then you'll suddenly, you'll know what happened. You're like, Oh, okay, wait, there's 21 jump street. John, Johnny Depp's pissed at Richard Grieco. Uh, go to my website, coopertalk.net. You can follow me there. Uh, you can follow me at Twitter. I have over 700 episodes on coopertalk.net. Email me, cooper at coopertalk.net. And don't forget my other site, stopthesalt.com. When, when I went through that health problem six years ago, I wrote a cookbook. It's 120 low-sodium recipes for one. Easy to make, no pictures to intimidate you. You can get it on Amazon or you can get it at stopthesalt.com. I make more money if you get it at stopthesalt.com. So people, I'm Steve Cooper. I'm only as hip as my guest. Don't forget, drink your water, eat your vegetables, take your vitamins, and I'll talk to you next week.